Well, this morning we are continuing uh, with our series on Jesus, follow me, and um, we know that the Father is all about receiving glory this morning. Uh, they can't look in the Word without seeing it. He's about uh, receiving glory, and so this morning we're going to talk about uh, how we can give the Father glory. We look at Jesus' life and say, man, Jesus, you live perfectly submitted to the Lord. How can we give the Father a glory? And so we're going to start with a story about King Herod. Because we need to learn some lessons on how not to give God glory. Or how, how, how do we live our life in a way that doesn't give glory to God? So it, if we're familiar with the story in the book of Acts. It's a story uh, that kind of talks a little bit about King Herod. And he was the king of Judea in uh, 42 AD, so a little bit after Jesus. And uh, he was one that put James to the sword. So he was one that, uh, that caused James uh, to be a martyr for the Lord. And then after that, we find that uh, he sends Paul to prison. And this is one of those uh, really amazing miracle moments. Uh, last night in our prayer gathering, we were praying and we said, God, we want to see your glory. We want to see kind of these miracle, awesome moments. You know, angels showing up, donkeys talking, miracles happening, you know, gold out of the fish's mouth. You know, like, we want to see this happen. We're praying for this. And, and I was reminded that of, of Paul being um, in prison. Sorry, Peter, sorry, being... I want to look at my notes because I'm getting the name wrong. I'm saying Peter and Paul. Um... And I want to look at Peter. Sorry, thank you. I have it right there. Peter. It looked like Paul. Uh, so, so James will put the sword. Peter is put in jail. And he's put in jail. And then an angel shows up. And he guides him out of the prison. And so I know. So part of me asking, God, would you do these amazing things? Um, that I may be put in situations. We may put, be put in situations where he's going to have to do amazing things. You know, that's part of this a little bit. You know, Peter was in prison. You know, that's not... Really, okay, God, I would love to see an angel, but God, don't, I don't want to have to get in prison to be able to see an angel happen, kind of this interaction happen. But he finds himself in prison, and the church gathers, and they're praying, and they're believing God, and saying, God, demonstrate your power, like, like rescue Paul, and Peter, sorry, save him, you know, make this uh, miracle happen. And the angel shows up, and he guides him out of the prison unharmed. And he, then he goes and he visits this prayer meeting, and they're like so in shock, they don't even, they're like, hey, Peter's at the door. Like, are you sure he's at the door? Like, yeah, the, the God answered our prayer. Peter's right here. And Herod, king of, king of the area, I mean, he got pretty upset at this moment. Uh, he got upset. He sentenced all of the prison guards to death. Mm -hmm. um, and he was a powerful person, and he held the... He, he held the money, he held the, the provision for the people in Tyre and Sidon. And so we move to the story, and in Acts chapter 12, we start seeing this, that he's the king over the people. He loves the power that he has over them. He's able to provide for them or take it away. I mean, like, they have to come to him and ask for provision. Like, there's, there's all this whole a power struggle. And the people in, in Tyre and Sidon, they desire to... Uh, have some favor with them. They, they want an audience with them, and they've been unsuccessful getting an audience with this king and, and being able to make their pleas known to him, but then in, in, in Acts chapter 12 is where we see that they, they do. They get an audience. They get one of his court members to be able to go and speak to King Herod on their behalf. And so in Acts chapter 12, verse 21 through 23, it kind of sums up the end of the story here, and it's going to be a, a great launching point for us to understand how do we live for the glory of the Father. And so in Acts chapter 12, verse 21 through 23, it records here this day. They finally get audience with King Herod. And so it says, this, On the appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and made a oration. He, he, made, he made a speech to them. And the people shouted, The voice of God and not of man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and died. Mm -hmm. Man, yeah, that's 
Amen. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> King Herod didn't recognize and didn't recognize that the place that he's had in, in the lives of the people, the authority that he had, even being an ungodly man, was from God. And the declaration that he made, being something that was from God, he didn't give God the credit. So it's good news for us, though, that not everyone who deceives God, not everyone who doesn't give glory to the Father, ends up being eaten by worms. It's, a, it's a good news this morning for us. Not everybody, like Ananias and Sapphira, who tried to deceive God in Acts chapter 5, dropped dead immediately. But it does warn us that there is an age to come where the judgment of God will come, and it will be more severely upon those who have not learned to give glory to God. Let's look at Isaiah. There's some Old Testament passages here that speak even greater, prophetically, strongly, that God is a God that designed things, that in, it has intentionality, that He would receive honor and He would receive glory. So let's look real briefly at Isaiah chapter 43. Love this um, prophetic passage of, of scripture in Isaiah 43. Um, uh, it's, it's a really encouraging one, especially when I'm praying for our city, when I'm praying for redemption, for, when I'm praying for restoration. And I, I get into this, and I'm like, "Yes, God, you know, you're going to bring the blind, you're going to bind up the broken, God, you're going to call the people from the north, south, east, and west. Yes, God, you're going to do these things." And right in the middle of this, Isaiah 43 verse 7, God proclaims this. He says that he has created us for his glory. He has created us for his glory, for his fame. And, and it's important to think about what this word glory means, right? We talk about the glory days of Michael Jordan, right? When he was just all out, balling, and, and like unstoppable, unconscious, just doing it, right? And you talk about his glory. It, when you talk about the glory of somebody, you talk about the fame of who he is. You're talking about his nature and his character. <laughs> God has created us for his fame, for his glory, that he would be honored. That we can look back and say, yeah, that was God. Yeah, God. Wow, when, he looks at, when we look at our deeds and when we look at who we are and the way that we live and the way that we breathe and move about our life, it's, wow, that's God. He created us for his sake, for his glory. We're not just a, a nicety on earth. Our life isn't just you know, for our own. It's, it's for the glory of God. In Isaiah 48, God's language gets even stronger. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 9 through 11. And it says this. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11. For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how should my name be profane. My glory I will not give to another. This is strong language from God. I don't know. You know, I, I love I love looking at the New Testament and I love looking at stories where I say, wow God, you're loving, you're compassionate, you're you're you're, you're you know for the people and you you're victorious for it. And God, you celebrate over us, you dance over us, God, you know our names, you know the hairs on our head. I love I love those verses. It makes me feel good, but God heart here is true, that he has done all these things crazy, not for you, not for me. He said, for myself, for my glory, that people may know me. I'm not talking to me, I'm pointing to myself, I'm not talking for Andrew, I, for God, God is saying, for 
God's glory. I have sent you through trials. I have, I have developed you. I have, I have refined you. I have redeemed you. And not so that somebody else can get the credit for it. Not so that somebody else could say they're not so Andrew, you could say how great you were, or how good you did, or how wonderful things are. No, I, I did all this. I the life that you live is all for me. For God. That others would say, ah. That is the God. That is the living God. That is Jehovah. That is the Almighty. That is the Holy One. That is God. He's done all this yep. for the fame of himself, for the glory of God. God describes that his glory and his fame and his honor is a driving force behind our individual lives. God, what are you doing in my life right now? Maybe the question would be, God, how are you designing my life in such a way that it would bring you glory? What are you doing in my life? What is this circumstance that you're bringing me through? Because it says here that he does, he, the trials that we go through, the furnace that we have, the affliction that we have, it was all for his sake. God, what are you bringing me through? What do you have me in the midst that you want to get the glory from? It's a driving force behind our life. Jesus undoubtedly lived by this truth, right? He, he encourages us to do the same. Because I know this is my Father's desire that He would receive glory. And, and it is, He encourages us, and we'll find here in Scripture this morning, He encourages us that we would do the same. How can we live a life that brings God the Father, glory. Let's look. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, or verse 14 through 16 this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, it says this. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. I used to love traveling through Missouri uh, back to go to college. You know, going um, from Madison, Wisconsin to Missouri, you drive through Illinois and it's just flat. There's nothing, there's cornfields, it's just, you know, boring. You get to Missouri and there's just a slight change. It's not, you know, drastic, but there are some hills that happen. And when we're traveling back to Springfield, Missouri, I, I tend to have like a, a photographic memory when I'm driving. You know, if I go to something one time, uh, I can drive there usually again without, without any aid. And so we're going back to Springfield, Missouri, and there's a point on our trip about 30 miles away from Springfield where there's a larger hill. And I always remember, I could like memorize where we were because it would all of a sudden, the light, the clouds would often, it's a, you know, eight hour drive, so I would leave here early and then get there and it would be dark. And you would be coming up the hill and then you could see on the sky the lights from the city. And I just, I remember, I love that. I, I remember seeing, that was like, oh, I know where I'm at. I know I'm just this far away. We're almost there to Springfield. But you could just see the light. It would shine up the whole sky and you'd come over the hill and boom, there's this, there's this city. And I, I, whenever I think about this picture, this, this passage here, I, I think about that picture in my mind. Like, this is who God has made us to be. You as an individual, us as a church community, as a body, a, a city, a light, an awe, a wonder for God's glory. So how can we bring glory to the Father through our lives? I think we can look at this passage and we'll see three observations. We're going to make three observations of how we can show glory. The first one is we see here that Jesus urges... I would even use the word commands that the good of our life should be to behave in such a way that God gets glory. So what does that mean? 
So that means that, that first the foundation is that our worship of God, the glory of the Father, does not is not limited to this hour and a half that we have on Sunday morning together. But it's in living a peculiar life. A life that's different. You know what I love about being a part of Kappa City Church? Is that we're a strange people. We're a peculiar people. But it's not just that we're weird people. No, I love us. We are a people that are doing things that cause other people to wonder. Why, why didn't you guys serve 100 people in this sanctuary building and, and do... Oh, it's because we love, because God has loved us. Man, I, I love this, the, even the testimony that Joey gave. Man, I, why did you break the leaves of the lady down the street? Why? It was because God, it was an unction from the Holy Spirit. It was, it was for God's glory. It was strange. It was different. He, I love that you even mentioned. She kind of was wondering why I'm coming near her, right? Like, we live a, a strange life, and, and it's for God's glory. Continue in this work, because in it, we are obedient to Christ's instructions here. Live peculiar. It's not just what we do on Sunday morning, and you guys are doing it. Man, I love it in our missional community on Wednesday night when our neighbor gets to come down the hall and sit with us, and, and even, uh, you know, I might have to edit this. But even when she's a, a little tipsy like she was on Wednesday, we all just sat around and was like, all right, let's encourage her in the Lord. Let's answer her question. And we found that even in what looked like chaos, God was able to weave it in such a way that the Holy Spirit still maintained order and his, his word received glory in it. I mean, we are a peculiar people. I thought for a moment, I said, maybe I should just send her home. Maybe it would be easier than I go. I mean, maybe this, right? I, but no, it, it urged me. It urged me, right? The word of God urged me that no, it's for God's glory. And I, and I can put up with a little interesting conversation in order that God would receive fame. Amen. I want to encourage you guys and praise and thank God for the church that is saying, yeah, it's about picking up people for church on Sunday morning. Yeah, it's about meeting for coffee. Yeah, it's about seeing what kind of resources we can give so that other people can know Jesus. This <coughs> is what it means that we would live our life and we should behave in such a way that God receives glory. It affects all of life. A second observation here is that we must be engaged in good deeds. In the same way that your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works. They may see your good deeds. We must continue in this. It's not our life with Christ, the glory that the Father receives. It is in a transformed life. That our life and all the sins that we once found ourselves entangled in are now no longer the things that define us. God receives glory in that. When he transforms a life and our life story turns around and people see that and they say, oh, that is God. Oh, he has hope now. Oh, the anger that he once had is no longer the patience that he now exuberates is not his own, it's from God. Man, when the life is transformed, man, it, it, it brings glory to God. But bringing glory to God is not just in our avoidance of gross, terrible sins. Yes, it starts there, because there we are redeemed, a restored people. But it is a pursuit of good deeds, of generosity, of kindness, of ways of love. And, and what I just exalted all of us for and encouraged all of us in, I would say continue in that. Continue in that. Pursue good works. Our transformed life, we're going to see here, as we look through a couple more passages in the New Testament, we're going to see here that our, our, our life in Christ, it is transformed, it is redeemed, but it's set apart for the purposes of God so that He can receive glory. <clears throat> God's goal in redeeming people is that good works, good deeds would be accomplished. And it sounds like a social gospel. No, it sounds like the gospel. Let's look here. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. This is 
talking about Jesus himself, it says this, that in Titus chapter 2, verse 14, he says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify for himself a people. We can stop there, because that's what we get excited about. I get excited about when I see an unbeliever come to know Jesus. I get excited because, yes, Jesus has redeemed me. Jesus has, uh, he has vanquished all of my iniquity. He has taken all of my sins away. He has made me right with God. He has made me a pure, uh, pure and righteous in God's sight because of the work that Christ has done. Praise the Lord. We celebrate that. I get excited. Man, I get excited when I get to evangelize and share the good news with you people, right? We, we can celebrate when we get to have baptisms and new believers coming. Man, it is exciting. God, Jesus, you did your work. You, you gave yourself for him. Worship with me, right? But the rest of it, he, he purified for himself a people of whom are zealous for good deeds. That are Excited, driven, zealous, ready, able, maybe not always able, willing to do the good works that God has laid out for us to do. And the prophets, it's clear, right? God, was, God created us for his glory. Jesus brings it about again in this Matthew passage, and he says that it's for his glory, and we, he receives glory. He, his, his glory is made known by the good works that we do, but then it's even complete. The testimony is completed again by, by Paul in Ephesians 2, chapter 10. We are God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good deeds, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. How do we give God's glory? How do we give the Father's glory? In part, I think in a large part, it's in doing the works that He's prepared for us. it's also possible to be that kind of do-gooder that brings no glory to God. So if it's possible, on one hand, that the good works that we do lead to an awe of God and, and makes His name known, then I would I would propose that it's also possible that we could be good doers that don't bring the Father glory. Right? Out of the goodness of their heart, people give time and give money and serve, and there's all sorts of amazing, great uh, organizations that serve people and, and help others and that are suffering through things. When we Think about the tragedies that have happened, the fires and the earthquakes and the and um, the floods and the hurricanes that have happened over the last year. Right there, there are tons of people doing good for the sake of doing good. They 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 do it. They have the extra means. They have the extra time. They they have the ability and they help alleviate suffering. But they may not believe in God, let alone do it for His glory. Let your light shine, that man may see your good deeds, and glorify God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. We are the light of the world. It's more than the action of doing good. I can spend all my time doing good. I remember a, a story of my brother doing good. They stopped on the side of the road and they helped a lady restart their her car and, and went on their way and they were super excited because they had done good. And then they realized, oh wait, there was no credit to God. There was no glory for God. It was, it was just a simple good deed. I believe the difference is the spirit from which the good deeds Low. How do 
do we do good? The question remains, how do we do good so that God gets the glory, right? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. First Peter chapter 2, verse 12, it says this, that we should maintain good conduct among the Gentiles, among those who don't believe, among those outside of the family of God. We maintain such good conduct among the Gentiles so that when they, when they, sorry, when you cause them to speak out against you as evildoers, when they try to speak out against you as evildoers, they would see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. I have a good friend, or a becoming good friend of mine, who pastors a church in some prairie, and just recently we did a Thanksgiving dinner uh, here and hosted uh, people in our in our building, and and they had an idea of giving away uh, pumpkin pies. They bought a hundred and something pumpkin pies. And they uh, had people register for the pumpkin pies. They came to, you know, to get their pumpkin pies. And when they, they got the pumpkin pies, there was all sorts of neat stories that he was uh, finding out about. This. One of the ladies, she came into the, uh, into the church and received the pumpkin pie. And she was a diverse, uh, she was a diverse family, a uh, uh, biracial family. And so um, she said about 12 years ago when she got married, they stopped going to church because the church that they were in, it didn't quite fit. And she said, when I walked in and got this pie, you know, there was diversity. All, I mean, we had all sorts of different people just serving us pies. And it was like uh, she knew she could belong there. And she actually came back after bringing the pie home. She came back just to tell them, thank you for doing this. But then what was interesting, they, they got too many pies. <laughs> a whole bunch of, the, you know, Costco pies. They're the big, huge pies, right? And so they said, you know, who can we go give the pies to? So they said they went to the fire department and they gave the fire department pie. And, and the fire department said, why are you guys doing this? I said, well, we're a local church and we love you guys and want to give you a pie. And they were just shocked and awe that the church would give away pies. And then they, then they went to the local police station and they went to the barber shop and they went to the schools and over and over again as they gave away pies, people were like, and you're a local church? It, 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 was, it, it was odd for them that a local church would engage them in a simple gesture of giving away a pie because it was messing with all of their preconceived ideas about the local church. I would propose to us as the Capital City Church, there are people around in our community that expect a certain kind of not untrue behavior from the church. That we just want to be secluded from them. We don't want to touch them. They're like the untouchables in our mind. Or, or, or like we're supposed to be separate from them. And maybe they've even in their life worked so they can be separated from the church. But guess what? And when we do these simple acts of good deeds, when we do these simple things to bring glory to the Father, it causes, the, we experience this First Peter chapter 2, 12 thing. They're doing a good deed and they're like, wow, that's pretty awesome. It's pretty awesome when we serve our community. It's pretty awesome. And they're like, this isn't normal. Mm -hmm. We have a really cool setup here in the Madison area. You know, if I, it wasn't in my notes, but you know, like when we think about our workplace and think about maybe the anti God thing that's going on in the workplace or, you know, all those rules and we kind of complain and say, oh, me, oh, my about, or, or, you know, I look at the list of Madison in the top 50 least churched or least, least Christian areas in the United States. And, you know, like that's true about our city. But guys, it's setting the gospel. It's setting up for this amazing demonstration of who God is. A simple good deed that is intentionally for the glory of the Father causes people to say, wow. That's peculiar. That's different. And I like it. It wasn't different. It was like weird. Like, oh, don't do that again. Don't bring us, uh, bring us pumpkin pie. No, it's it different. And is that what the church is like? Is that what the Father is like? That's how Jesus is encouraging us. 
We're a city on a hill. We're a light, not meant to be hidden, but meant to be shown. Do good deeds so that the Father gives glory. Continue in it, church. Continue in it. First Peter, let's turn chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. First Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. Because in anything, we still need to answer this question, how do we do the good works so that God gets the glory? How do we change this? How, I, I love doing good things. I love helping people out. How do I do it? God, so that you can get the glory. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I broke 10. I'm going to start in verse 7. Verse 7. <laughs> the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self controlled and sober minded. For the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Keep on loving each other. It covers our mistakes. When you see a glaring mistake, keep on loving it. It makes up for the mistake. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I love it. Show hospitality to one another. We just left it there. No, I think the Peter and the Holy Spirit, they do who we are, right? And sometimes we show hospitality, but it's kind of grumbly. It's like, all right, I'll open my house. He says, show hospitality, but do it without grumbling. Do it earnestly. Do it because you love each other. Do it because we're family. Do it because you love your neighbor. Do it because God invited us into his family and into his holy space. He said, I, I didn't care about your mess. You come to me, right? No grumble. Verse 10. Here's where, we, here's where I wanted to start. The other stuff is good too. As each, of, each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as a good steward of God's very grace. God's gifted us each in unique ways. He's, he's formed us. He gives us talents and interests. Be a good steward of it because God's grace is very to each one. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. How do we do good works that Father would receive glory. We do the good works by the strength that God supplies. We do the good works not only in the abilities that we have, not only in the giftings that we have, not only in obedience because the pastor gave us an example and we're going to do that this week. We do it on the strength of God. There's two different ways we can serve. All right, we have a sample of, hey, me, I, I just asked, I actually didn't even set that up that way. It was, I, I had this plan to speak this way before I asked everybody to help uh, roll up the tube outside. <laughs> <laughs> but thinking about that example even now, there's two different ways in which we can accomplish that good deed, that simple work. Is when I have, I have, one, I have the ability. I can go out there in my strength. I know I can do it. I know how to roll up the thing. I know how to tie a knot really well so I can do it. I want to go out there and, hey, in two minutes flat, I got it done. And there's another sense of it, and, and, and this is where uh, I think this speaks to God's glory. God, I, I don't have the extra time. 
Right? I don't have the strength. I don't even know how to roll a thing. I, I, I don't want to get dirty. I, I have all of these reasons why. I, but God, in your strength, God, for your, for your sake, God, I'm going to take time to do this for you. There's a difference in my spirit. I can do it. I want to get it done. Or, oh, God, in your strength, in your ability, God, I'll help out. Maybe I'll be the one just standing there because I can't reach down and get and, and ring it. I'll just stand there and I'll, I'll encourage everybody. Hey, keep on going. You got, you got it. But we're doing it in God's strength. He gets the glory. The hook is we owe every ounce of strength ability to God. Everything we do. The breath in our love. When we were created, he, and I said, he created us for his glory. Everything we are, all of our desires, all of our talents, all of, all of that we've developed, all of it has been, all of our strength, all of our breath, all of who we are, it's all from God. Now, to, for him to receive glory, God, all that you have, I do it not for my own, not for my own credit. God, use me. The part of it, part of us in the room, we could just say, God, use me. There's things in our life. There's things, and we just say, God, I surrender to you. Right? We sing that kind of this kind of song. God, for your glory, my whole life, God, whatever you ask me, God, I, it's all for you. Sometimes we admit, God, I don't have it. I don't have what I need. I don't have what I, what I need to come to God. I, God, but in your strength, God, depending on you, God, leaning into all of who you are, God, I, I want to give you credit for everything that I have. And he received glory. Serve as one who renders service by strength, which is supplied by God. Capacity Church, I am excited. I am encouraged by the ways that I see you on a regular basis, the ways that I hear about you on a regular basis, serving, doing the good works, going after it, saying, yeah, it's not just about what I do on Sunday morning that brings glory to God. It's about my everyday life. It's about the way that I spend my time. It's about the way that I serve my family. It's about the way that I serve my neighbors. It's, the, it's about the way that I move and the way that I breathe. It's about everything. And, and, and you guys are going after it. I want to encourage you that the message this morning from Jesus, he urges us or he commands us, keep on doing the works that you're doing in such a way that it brings God glory because you are the light of the world. You are the change. You are the hope. You, in you, you hold the hope. You are the light. You are the beacon that said, this is what God looks like. And I hope in one breath, like I opened the, the message this morning, Herod, he had to be warned. He, he, Ananias and Sapphira, are there stories of what it would look like when people do not give glory to God for the deeds that they're able to accomplish? So there's a warning in that. But I think most of all, there's an encouragement from Christ this morning. Continue doing good works. Continue doing it. And remember, all for the glory of the Father. All in his strength. I encourage my brother, Kurt, this morning. He had an opportunity to, to sow some seeds into somebody's life that last night. You know, and, and, and maybe it wasn't a moment of harvest. Right? Maybe it isn't, it isn't a moment when we do our good deed and all of a sudden, after raking leaves, the lady falls in repentance and says, Oh Lord, you are my God. I will serve you for the rest of my life. Our responsibility as followers of Jesus is to remain in obedience, is to remain in a posture of dependence so that the Father 